Good evening, everyone. My name is Mark Lee, and I would like to welcome everyone to tonight's webinar offered by the Scoliosis Research Society on the topic of scoliosis in the young child. Uh, the Scoliosis Research Society, just as background, uh, was founded in 1966 and consists of uh, a little over a thousand members. Uh, members consist of researchers, surgeons, physician assistants, and orthotists. The society is committed to research and education of physicians and patients. So the purpose of tonight's talk is to provide an overview of scoliosis in the young child, including natural history, diagnosis, and current treatment paradigms. Um, the natural history segment will be uh, discussed by Dr. Michael Vitale. Uh, Dr. Phillips will talk about diagnosis, and Dr. Price and Dr. Shah will talk about treatment options. As we proceed through the uh, webinar, please use the chat function um, on your display for questions, and these will be answered at the end of the conference. In addition, uh, the webinar will be available on the SRS website for review after this webinar. These are the relevant disclosures. And to begin, we'll have uh, Dr. Michael Vitale, who is the Anna Lucia Professor of Pediatric Orthopedics and Neurosurgery at Columbia Presbyterian, talk about natural history and etiology of scoliosis in the young child. Thanks very much, Mark, and uh, good evening, everyone. And uh, it's a real pleasure to be able to participate in this webinar with uh, my colleagues today. I hope you enjoy it. And I'll just uh, encourage everyone to uh, use the chat function to send in some questions. It can be uh, part of the fun of an interactive experience like this. I'm going to speak a little bit about natural history and etiology of early onset scoliosis. <coughs> Go to the next slide, please, Jenny. Hi, Jen. I'm going to ask you to advance the slides for me. I'm having a bit of difficulty. So can I ask you to, there you go. So um, I think uh, first and foremost, it's important to know that when we speak about early onset scoliosis, it's not a specific diagnosis. Uh, Bill Phillips shared uh, this slide with me, and it, it, early onset scoliosis is really the definition of more than 10 degrees of spinal curvature in a kid less than 10 years of age. As you can see from this pie graph, the majority of kids with idiopathic scoliosis based on the literature are idiopathic, uh, but I think this varies quite a bit, and in many tertiary referral places like mine at Columbia, um, it's a much more even split of kids with neuromuscular, syndromic, and congenital etiologies. Next slide. We uh, spent some time with the Children's Spine Study Group look, developing a classification of early onset scoliosis. In contrast to the lengthy classification of AIS, the COS, or classification of early onset scoliosis, uh, looks not only at the curve specifics, but the age of the child, the etiology, the major curve, um, the kyphosis, and then a modifier for progression. So because these kids are much more heterogeneous, um, we've looked at um, classifying these kids in a more global way. Perhaps most important is the, mo the progression modifier. In fact, most of decision-making uh, really should be based on the amount of progression. And for me, if a kid is rapidly progressing, I'm more likely to operate on a 40-degree curve than if a kid has a 60-degree congenital uh, scoliosis, which is stable over time. This has been pretty well validated. The COS has been shown to predict complications, progression, and outcomes of early onset scoliosis. Next slide. This is the kid that we're talking about. We're talking about kids with complex deformities of the spine and thorax. Sometimes they have fused ribs. The deformities can get very large. Next slide. And, uh, and start to intrude into the chest. And it's that last part that really uh, makes us worry. Uh, 
Why do we care about early onset scoliosis? I think many people on the call recognize that this is a potentially fatal disease. A number of studies have shown uh, accelerated mortality, early death for children with infantile idiopathic and early onset scoliosis, which is much different than adolescent idiopathic scoliosis. Next slide, please. It's now pretty well understood, uh, please advance, Jen, that uh, kids with early onset scoliosis, yeah, please advance, uh, have poor outcomes and poor natural history because of the intimate developmental relationship between the thorax, the heart, and the lungs. Basically, the, the thorax or the chest wall um, uh, determines the pace and amount of alveolar hypertrophy. So if your chest wall is too small, your lungs literally don't develop, don't, your alveoli don't multiply, and you end up with an amount of pulmonary tissue that's essentially incompatible uh, to sustain life. Next slide. People have looked at this all sorts of ways, and it's well understood that the size of the curve and also the amount of rotation uh, very significantly correlates with lung function. In fact, Brian Snyder has developed a rabbit model for early onset scoliosis. And by tethering uh, ribs, he's shown that as the curves get larger and larger, lung function and lung growth is proportionally inhibited. Next slide. We've learned a fair amount over the last century about the natural history of scoliosis. Uh, we, we understand very well that given the intimate relationship between the spine, thorax, and lungs, early onset scoliosis can be a bad disease. For the young kid presenting to my practice with a large curve, I think we need to look at this much like a diagnosis of a cancer or significant heart disease. The mistakes of the past have allowed us to understand that we have to avoid early fusion, and I'll uh, explain that a bit in a minute. You'll hear from uh, my co-panelists a little bit about the promise of casting and how casting has made such a big difference, especially for the idiopathic infantile subgroup. And finally, you'll hear from my uh, colleagues uh, the uh, array of non-fusion, so-called growth-friendly options that are available to children with early onset scoliosis. Next slide, please. We're going to start out looking at uh, the, each of the different theologies, starting with the idiopathic type. Slide, please. Idiopathic infantile scoliosis, perhaps the most common type of early onset scoliosis. These are situations where boys slightly outnumber girls. Left thoracic single curves are most common. Early onset idiopathic scoliosis often is self-limiting and often resolves. About 80% of the time, these curves can be observed and you can watch the curve get smaller and smaller and, um, and often go away. However, as you saw in the previous Nakabum slide where there was uh, increased mortality, in the subset of kids who have progression, this could be a real problem. One of the things that infantile idiopathic scoliosis has taught us about natural history is outcomes, quality of life, pulmonary function, and in fact, mortality is directly related to the onset of scoliosis. So these kids with significant curves at one and a half years of age are really on a bad trajectory. Next slide. The term early onset scoliosis, in fact, was coined in 1936 by Harenstein. Ponsetti, James, Morgan, Wynn Davies, and McMaster all subsequently published about uh, young children with scoliosis. Most recently, Fernandez and Weinstein uh, uh, wrote a paper looking at the natural history of the idiopathic infantile uh, population. In truth, the natural history of this population is not fully understood because few patients in the U.S. have been untreated in the last 75 years. 
much of what we know about natural history comes from other countries and from historical studies here. Still, we have a good understanding that the age of onset and early progression are the factors most associated with poor outcome. Next slide, please. In the infantile idiopathic scoliosis population, common associated factors include plagiocephaly, mental retardation, developmental dysplasia of the hip, and epilepsy. And looking at that group of comorbidities, it makes it a bit difficult to truly cat categorize these kids as idiopathic. Many of them, in fact, probably have some other um, etiology of their scoliosis, and we still haven't been able to uh, properly uh, uh, classify these kids. In 1965, Lloyd Roberts um, uh, uh, put together the association of plagiocephaly, DDH, and sometimes foot deformity, and recognized that idiopathic infantile scoliosis most likely represents a molding disorder from intrauterine compression. In fact, IIS has been shown to be more common in firstborn children, women with uh, oligohydramnios, multiparous uh, deliveries, and large babies, again supporting the etiology of a potential molding disorder, at least as an initiating or uh, contributing factor to IIS. Next slide, please. Min Meta probably uh, has a bigger part in the history of idiopathic infantile scoliosis treatment than anyone uh, else. Dr. Meta, also afflicted with scoliosis, uh, devoted her life to treatment of this disorder, developed the population of children with idiopathic uh, infantile scoliosis, and developed a very careful uh, method for casting these kids. The story is very much analogous to the story of Dr. Ponsetti and clubfoot treatment. You'll hear more about this from my colleague shortly. Next slide. One of the things that Dr. Mehta showed us is that the natural history of idiopathic infantile scoliosis is related to a radiographic criteria called the rib vertebral angle difference. This is simply the asymmetry between the ribs and the bottom of the apical vertebra from the right to the left side. Children with RVADs or rib vertebral angle differences greater than 25 exhibit much higher rates of progression. Next slide. Turning to congenital scoliosis, we'll talk a little bit about uh, natural history. Next slide. Again, this is a, even within the congenital scoliosis population, a bit of a heterogeneous group of kids. Many of these kids have significant comorbidities. Here you see a child with a L3A hemivertebra, as uh, evidenced on a CT scan. This is a kid who's COs is two, C for congenital, three because their curve is more than 50 degrees, normal kyphotic, and P2. P2 implies that this child has exhibited significant progression, uh, which to me is a call for surgical intervention. This child, next slide, uh, undergoes a resection of her hemivertebra, next slide, uh, and generally have good outcomes, although, uh, the chance of uh, reoperation is quite high. Uh, of major import is that there is a roughly 15% association between congenital cardiac anomalies, congenital renal anomalies, and spinal dysraphism. In this slide, you see diastatomyelia, a large cervical syrinx, and a child with congenital scoliosis. For every child with congenital scoliosis, cardiac and renal ultrasounds are absolutely necessary, as is a often a sedated uh, screening MRI of their spinal column. Many times, abnormalities uh, will be actionable. 
Next slide, please. Speaking of spinal dysphrasisms, this has a big effect on the natural history of congenital early onset scoliosis. In the 10 or 15% of kids with neural axis disorders, some are incidental, but some require treatment. The literature shows roughly 50% of curves less than 35 degrees partially or completely resolve after surgical management of a tethered cord or, or an Arnold Chiari malformation. In fact, this can be one of the best outcomes for the children uh, with early onset scoliosis. Next slide. Turning to neuromuscular early onset scoliosis, again, we're confronted with a heterogeneous group of disorders. Cerebral palsy most commonly, but also muscular dystrophies, spinal muscular atrophies. Today I saw a kid from uh, Dubai with post-polio syndrome uh, and a variety of other neuromuscular disorders can cause quite rapid progression at an early age. We know that, it, uh, that a curve with a magnitude of 30 degrees, less than six years of age, and especially with a hip dislocation, portends the absolute highest chance of progression. Next slide. Finally, turning attention to the uh, classification of syndromic early onset scoliosis, it's clear that we're in uh, a very complex uh, territory here. There are literally hundreds of syndromes that result in early onset scoliosis, including certain syndromes that have a unique expression, such as Marfan's neurofibromatosis, and skeletal dysplasias. Many of these children have significant comorbidities requiring the need for careful preoperative evaluation and optimization. Next slide. Finally, uh, we've learned quite a bit about treatment of uh, early onset scoliosis. Historically, um, Surgeons treated early onset scoliosis with fusions, thinking that getting a straight spine would allow uh, improvement in natural history. Numerous authors, as listed here, including our study uh, not so long ago, have shown that in fact, early spine fusion is associated with adverse pulmonary outcomes. Stopping the thorax from growing at an early age is as bad as having a big uh, scoliosis uh, uh, without treatment. Next slide. In this study at our institution, we showed significant decreases in pulmonary function only eight years after fusion of kids at, with an average age of five years. Next slide. This is the poster child. Next slide of a kid who unfortunately had an early fusion uh, and ended up dying from pneumonia at 25 years of age. What's out in 2018 uh, is early fusion. This is really, should be avoided at all, at all costs. Next slide. And you'll hear from some of my colleagues about treatment options. Finally, the reality of treatment of early onset scoliosis is that there is significant equipoise significant uncertainty in indications and too many complications. And you'll hear that although we're improving with regard to decision-making and treatment, uh, there's still much to be done to improve and maximize the natural history of this uh, heterogeneous group of disorders. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. Uh, finally, uh, in conclusion, early onset scoliosis is a difficult disorder. Progression is quite likely if the age of onset of a 30-degree curve is present before six years of age. As uh, uh, well understood at this point, early onset scoliosis has detrimental effects on the developing lungs, and treatment must at all costs avoid fusion and allow growth. And you'll hear a lot more about that in the next 45 minutes. Next slide. Thank you very much, and uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of the webinar tonight. Thank you very much, Mike.
Um, next, we'll have uh, Bill Phillips, who's Professor of Orthopedic Surgery and Pediatrics at Texas Children's Hospital. Um, he'll be talking about examination and diagnostic evaluation of scoliosis in the young child. Bill, I'm not sure that we can hear you. Um, may need, we may need to switch the microphone over, please, Jen. So, right, can you hear me now? Hello? Yeah, very good. We can hear Looks you great. Looks good. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay, so um, so good evening. Um, welcome to the webinar. Um, I want to. I'm going to give an overview of a general assessment of how we look at a child with early onset scoliosis. Uh, please understand, as Dr. Vitale talked about, there's a great deal of variability in the children, and there's also some variability in doctors as well. So please don't take it wrong if your doctor doesn't do everything exactly the way I talk about in the next few minutes. So I'm going to try to give you an overview of what to expect when you see the surgeon. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, one thing it's important to remember is we are we are orthopedic surgeons, we are not radiologists. We don't treat the x-ray, we treat the child. And before we can do that, we need to learn more about your child and about the family, because the best way to do things is to have shared decision-making. As orthopedic surgeons, we know maybe a little bit about scoliosis, uh, but you are the experts on your child. And what's the best thing for one child may not be the best thing for another. And we need to combine those expertises that we have. Next slide, please. So overview of what happens when you bring a child in, we're going to get a history, physical exam, maybe some imaging studies, maybe some laboratory and some other studies. And then you're going to see us more than once, most likely. We're going to do some follow-up evaluations to see if there's been any changes and also see if there's been any interventions, what the effects of those are. Next slide, please. Uh, as Dr. Vitale talked about, there's some varying etiologies. Uh, some are obviously relevant, uh, very quickly apparent, like this one-year-old boy uh, with severe thoracic insufficiency syndrome. Uh, sometimes they're determined by the process of elimination. Uh, there is no surefire way to prove someone has idiopathic scoliosis. All you can do is rule everything else out, and that's what you're left with. Next slide, please. Uh, idiopathic scoliosis, there should be no neurologic deficit. They may have occasional back pain. Uh, as Dr. Vitale talked about, in the young child, they're more likely to have neuroaxis abnormalities. And uh, the majority of children at some point, uh, particularly if they're progressive or if they're going to be going, uh, having some sort of uh, intervention, are probably going to wind up getting a screening MRI. Uh, next slide, please. Because this is what can sometimes uh, show up. Here is a ch an eight-year-old that came in uh, with no obvious uh, neurologic deficits. Uh, she got an MRI, which showed this large uh, uh, cyst in her cervical spinal cord uh, that required neurosurgical intervention before considering managing the uh, scoliosis. Uh, next slide, please. So our goal is to assess what other problems the child may have, uh, see if the scoliosis is causing any problems, and in some cases try to determine the cause of that scoliosis. And we do this with sort of three parts, the, the history and the interview, the physical exam, and then uh, in imaging and laboratory studies. Next slide, please. So on the history, we want to know if there's any other problems that your child may have. Do they have pain? Do they have problems breathing? Do they snore? Uh, do they have, uh, have they met any milestones appropriate for their age, such as bladder and bowel control? Where are they on their activities of daily living? Next slide, please. Uh, their past medical history would be things like their birth history, uh, previous hospitalizations and surgeries. Uh, sometimes we're not the first doctor that somebody sees for their scoliosis. We want to know family history. As Dr. Vitale alluded, sometimes these conditions run in families. Also, if they're going to have any intervention, sometimes anesthetic problems and bleeding problems can run in families. Uh, finally, the social milieu is important as well. 
Uh, I practice in Texas, and I take care of kids who live many, many hours away. And so sometimes transportation issues uh, can become a big deal. Uh, maybe not so much for Dr. Vitale. All they got to do is get on the subway there in New York City. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, red flags in that uh, would be things like constant pain, particularly if it awakens the child at night. Uh, systemic complaints such as uh, fever, weight loss, or night sweats. If a child is going backwards, if they have reached developmental milestones and then lose them, and then another potential possible red flag, as Dr. Vitale mentioned, is uh, rapid progression. These are things that warrant a very careful uh, scrutiny. Uh, uh, next slide, please. On physical exam, uh, want to get some idea of what the child generally looks like. Uh, not so much in ego, in, in, in idiopathic, but in other forms, nutrition is sometimes a major thing. Is she comfortable? Is he anxious? Is he alert? How well can she communicate and, and make her wishes known, and particularly if there's going to be some sort of intervention like casting? Next slide, please. We want to get some idea of where they are. Oh, go back one, please compared to their age match controls for their things like their height and their weight, uh, their respiratory rate, their heart rate, those might be elevated if the child's having some uh, pulmonary issues. One of the things to remember about height is if a child has a significant scoliosis, that will shorten them. And there's a variety of tricks to come up with a corrected height to uh, calculate things like body mass index and pulmonary functions. Uh, in some cases that could be used as the arm span in other cases, there are tables to uh, correlate the length of subcutaneous bones like the tibia or ulna. Uh, but just using a raw height is sometimes not the best thing to do. Next slide, please. Uh, sometimes we do a neurologic exam. And that can be uh, challenging depending on the child's ability to cooperate. Uh, check for strength and sensation. I try to see how they walk. I see how they can, if they're age appropriate, able to walk on their toes and their heels and maybe hop. If they're unable to walk, what's their sitting balance? What's their muscle tone like? Check the range of motion of their extremities, see how well they have uh, uh, control of their movements and see if they have any uh, limb deformities as well that may give a tip off this to other problems. Next slide, please. And then last but certainly not least, to look at the back, we wanna preserve the child's modesty, but we really do wanna see as much of their back as possible. We look for things like uh, birthmarks and midline dimples or hairy patches. Uh, look and see if there's a shoulder or waist asymmetry. See if there's a trunk asymmetry. And then have them bend forward and see if there's rotation, which can be a sign of uh, uh, curvature. Maybe in some cases assess their flexibility by bending from side to side or just lifting them up. And then finally, um, uh, chest, check their chest expansion as well. Uh, next slide, please. And then uh, this is how primary care doctors will look at this because as the spine curves, it rotates and the ribs up, go up on one side and go down on the other. And if the child is old enough to cooperate, uh, then you can uh, sometimes um, uh, see that there's a, a prominence there. And this is called the uh, rib prominence and, and forward bending can pick this up. Next slide, please. And this, there's various gadgets for this. Most smartphones now have a function like this. And parents, yes, you can download these, but please don't use it more than once a month. And it measures a, a thing called the angle of trunk rotation, or ATR for short. Next slide, please. Uh, so the gold standard for evaluating a child with scoliosis or potential scoliosis remains imaging. The downside of it is we have to use ionizing radiation, so we want to minimize it as much as possible. Uh, and it's better to get it with them standing up or sitting up so you can see the effect of gravity on the spine. Ideally, the entire spine is on one image and not every place has the resources to do that. We turn the child around so their back is to the x-ray source to reduce the radiation of the breast and thyroid. And the lateral x-ray is good initially, but not always necessary on the follow-up visits, but that depends on the child. Next slide, please. Uh, and then, uh, as Dr. Vitale talked about, we measure it using what's called the, the standard way is the Cobb method, where the top of the vertebra, a line is drawn from the top of one of the top vertebra and the bottom of the bottom vertebra, and the angle between them is measured. Uh, please understand that there is substantial error in that. Both intra observer, even if I measure the same x ray twice, and intra observer, if one of my colleagues measure it, and then uh, I measure it. And even the place the x ray is taken 
from one hospital to another can sometimes create small variations that are not necessarily truly significant changes in a curve size. Next slide, please. Uh, and there is a rough correlation between what's measured using a scoliometer and uh, what's, what's measured on an x-ray. Uh, but uh, sometimes this is a little bit uh, a wide range there. And we've learned that children with a high BMI of over 85th percentile for age, you have to drop this down more before you think about the size of the curve being significant. Next slide, please. And remember, too, that this is apples and oranges. And even though both of these measurements are in degrees, they really measure different things. And you can't translate one for the other. A, a six-degree trunk rotation is not the same as a six-degree uh, cob angle. Next slide, please. And then finally, um, sometimes we need to figure out how much growth a child has left. Uh, we have a couple of different ways to do that. Uh, on the spine x-ray, sometimes we can see the ossification of the uh, iliac crest, the so-called Risser sign. Uh, sometimes we will do other things such as x-rays of the hand or in some cases the, the other bones, the knees or the uh, elbows. Uh, next slide, please. And then monitoring these children is a balancing act. We want to keep an eye on the scoliosis and not let it get out of hand so that you can intervene in an appropriate manner. But at the same time, particularly if you're starting with a child that's two or three or four years old, uh, you want to minimize the radiation exposure as much as possible. Um, in a shorter time interval, may make it difficult to distinguish between two changes in measurement error. And so I would say my colleagues and I usually don't like to get x-rays under most circumstances less than every four months and sometimes maybe even a little longer than that. But that varies depending on the exact circumstances. Next slide, please. And then advanced imaging. Uh, Dr. Vitale's already talked about the MRI. Uh, it has a number of uses. It, there's no radiation involved. Uh, it's, it's really good at looking at soft tissues like the spinal cord. In some circumstances, you can use it to measure breathing better and looking at the diaphragm. Uh, but it takes longer to get acquire the images. And so children who are younger need sedation or general anesthesia. And that raises a whole other set of problems. And then finally, with certain types of implants, uh, the MRI just may not be possible at all. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, another advanced imaging is a computer, uh, a computer axial tomography. Uh, it's great for looking at bone. We can create uh, 3D reconstructions and even print out 3D models. Um, it's important to make sure the place doing it understands that this is not a parent, it's a child, and the radiation dose can be limited uh, by setting better parameters on the machine. Next slide, please. And so uh, reasons to look, consider advanced imaging is to look for possible etiology and also for surgical planning. And doctors will vary in their use of this exactly when they want to do it. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, pulmonary function, as Dr. Vitale has alluded, is, a very, is really what we're concerned about in these kids. Um, it's difficult to accurately get pulmonary function studies in most circumstances in children under age five. Uh, they don't cooperate well, and also the normal values are not really there for kids less than five. And then finally, those normal values are based on the height of a child, so you may need to correct for the height loss. Otherwise, you may not get a true a sense of how much pulmonary function they've lost. Uh, you can also do pulse oximetry and draw blood gases and other things, but that means sticking them with a needle. Next slide, please. Other tests can be uh, measuring the height, weight, and body mass index, and for nutrition, their mid-upper arm circumference, and sometimes, particularly if planning a big surgery, uh, checking some other factors like free albumin and so on, uh, but that requires a blood test as well. Next slide, please. Uh, then, as Dr. Vitale talked about, uh, in congenital scoliosis, there can be other problems. And uh, a renal ultrasound is good for congenital scoliosis, or sometimes a screening MRI can pick that up, echocardiogram. In some cases, uh, bone density is, a, is an important consideration, but there's no valid controls for eight under age five. And then finally, uh, I want to talk a little bit about the AOSQ24, a, a quality of life questionnaire. Next slide, please. And Dr. Patan, we treat children, not x-rays. And a good outcome for a child and their family is more than making the curve a smaller number. And sometimes we have to ask, how much curve treatment is too much 
And what's best for one child and one family may not be the best for another. Next slide, please. And uh, Dr. Vitale and his group in uh, Columbia has developed a uh, validated questionnaire that you might get asked to fill out, uh, asking about various aspects of your child's life and your life as well uh, to see how well things are going and whether the treatment is uh, meeting all of your child and your needs, not just the x-ray itself. Next slide, please. So to summarize, we really need to do a lot to figure out how your child is doing, how, how well the treatment is working. And as one of my mentors taught me, you treat the child that has the scoliosis and you treat the scoliosis the child has. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Bill. Uh, next, we have uh, Nigel Price, who's Associate Professor of Orthopedics and Spine Surgery Section Chief at the University of Missouri, Kansas City School of Medicine. He'll be talking about non-operative treatment options for early onset uh, or uh, scoliosis. Well, good evening, everybody, um, and welcome to the uh, treatment and uh, discussion of uh, scoliosis in the young child. Advance slide, please. So non-operative treatment options uh, include observation and physical therapy or other forms of manual or complementary treatment. And this uh, treatment with physical therapy, uh, particularly Schroth and other methods are becoming popularized globally. Although the literature is uh, starting to accumulate on this and the exact role of treatment of the very young child with physical therapy is not yet defined. There are many talented practitioners of physical therapy who are doing physical therapy for scoliosis specific exercise programs, and they're doing it quite effectively. And this is turning out to be quite complimentary and quite supportive for families who have children with scoliosis. What has been established now for generations is some form of casting. And wrist or cast is somewhat of a, uh, an anachronistic word at this point because this is uh, being replaced increasingly by the elongation, derotation, flexion casting method or meta method. Bracing is often used as an alternative to casting or as a follow on after a program of casting. And then there's emergence and uh, hybridization of these treatments with traction and casting and uh, a combination of casting or brace hybrid treatments. A word on physical therapies and scoliosis specific exercises. Well, this has been practiced in parts of Europe and Asia for generations. It's a relatively newer approach to treatment of scoliosis in North America and has been practiced in several centers across the, uh, in North America uh, for the last generation. Most of the therapists are uh, trained in various European-based uh, schools of treatment, and I think uh, fueled in part to an increasing public awareness and re receptivity to this, it's becoming an adjunct of care. And I think many families do find that the insight that well-trained and uh, credentialed therapists bring to the treatment plan are, is quite reassuring. It can be, of course, quite challenging in young patients because of uh, compliance and interest. And uh, some therapists have voiced to me their concerns about early burnout uh, when patients um, are in a physical therapy uh, and particularly regimented physical therapy program early. <clears throat> but I think the insightful therapist can find a very nice balance and uh, again, I think many uh, families find it quite reassuring to have a broad uh, spectrum of treatment specialists who are attending uh, to their uh, child's needs. Compliance historically has been very difficult to assess, as one might imagine, and many of the studies are essentially self-reporting studies, so the accuracy of those studies has been challenged. And the treatment of physical therapy is uh, challenging to study. There are many schools of therapy and many uh, individual approaches to it. So it's, it's uh, uh, proven to be quite a, a difficult uh, 
adjunct of therapy to uh, compare to surgical treatments. These are some examples where a uh, experienced therapist has employed some of the Schroth methodology, which employs uh, some guidance and coaching and the patient can soon learn the exercises that are expected of them. In the last generation or so, non-operative treatment options have made a resurgence. And this is in part fueled by some of the uh, reporting of uh, some of the challenges with uh, doing surgery, and particularly growing rod type of surgery in young children. So this interest, uh, which is uh, sort of steamrolled over the last 15 years, does parallel society's desire for less surgery for conditions such as club feet, and uh, as previously mentioned, a club foot uh, treatment is by and large very non-operative, uh, at least early on, and the surgical treatment is for the children who haven't responded. In two studies uh, by Dr. Min Mehta, for, who first reported it in the early 70s, uh, the eff efficacy of her metacasting method was highlighted. And in her follow-up study, she once again showed that many children do respond to serial casting. So with this less uh, enthusiastic response for early surgery as the data emerged about diminishing returns, such as unplanned trips to the operating, uh, operating room and complications of treatment and stiff kneeling spines, the role of casting has expanded. So who gets a cast? As we learned in the evaluation discussion, curves over 25 to 30 degrees, who are, which are getting worse or not resolving, the river T will angle uh, that is measured at greater than 20 degrees, and in cases where there's rib overlap or phase two, uh, which portends uh, poor prognosis, may be a candidate for casting. Of course, it, the practitioner needs to be technically able to apply a cast, and that speaks to the uh, resources and the experience and the training of the team. So what is a RISR or meta or elongate uh, cast, elongation, derotation, flexion cast? Well, it usually starts with a specialized frame. And in this case, uh, this is an AML type frame, but there are variations of this now available. Essentially, the patient is in a back down or supine position. We typically like to use a special first layer that has some uh, silver impregnate, impregnation uh, that uh, is back to your static. And the patient comes to the operating room, typically with this garment and a second layer over it. The patient's put under a general anesthetic and uh, when uh, under an anesthetic with intubation, we like to protect the ears and evacuate the air out of the stomach. We like to support the arms and a hands out perpendicular position, slightly flex the hips and put some halter traction at the neck and some straps over the pelvis to get a little bit of inline traction. Most uh, casts these days are uh, a plaster layer followed by a fiberglass layer if we're following some of the uh, more popular methods. And once the cast is on, it's trimmed and the patient can walk and it's typically repeated every six to 12 weeks, depending on the age of the patient. Here's some other highlights of the casting methodology with inline traction and hip flexion Here's uh, a patient getting uh, the fiberglass layer and then some uh, trimming. And the finished product uh, emphasizes adequate room for the abdomen and the chest, adequate room for the hips, adequate room for the arms to move, and of course, adequate room for the neck area. And here's an example of someone who's just freshly out of a cast showing that uh, while the contact areas do have a little bit of evidence of, of pressure, uh, pressure sores that typically aren't a real problem for the majority of patients. Successful resolution of the curve, of course, would be the, the best outcome. And uh, many of these curves do 
uh, respond to casting, particularly if the uh, curvature is less than 30 to 40 degrees. The larger curves represent a very, very challenging group of patients, and it's much more difficult to achieve a, a quote, cure for these patients. I think in many of these cases, the best we can hope for is to prolong the uh, uh, the eventual uh, instrumentation and the growth-friendly surgery that they may have. But certainly in some cases, we can buy one or two or three years, and instead of a patient having surgery at the age of two or three or four, we might be able to get them out to five, six, seven, or, or even longer. So there, it, it definitely has a role to delay surgery and to delay progression. Cast outcomes um, are, as I said, highly variable depending on the uh, stiffness of the curve and the age of the patient and the initial size. But in some cases, we can uh, treat quite successfully to the point where we can do maintenance, maintenance casting or maintenance brazing, rather, and that patient can avoid the surgery. Bracing represents an alternative to casting, and in my practice, it represents a continuum of care uh, or a, um, a evolution from casting to a, uh, a maintenance uh, program. Bracing is very challenging uh, in this age group, and it does take a brace maker who has significant expertise in applying trunk or spine braces. It does require frequent checks for fit, and to accommodate growth. And the best design incorporates some modularity that allows the brace maker to expand or lengthen the brace to accommodate growth. Radiographs are taken either in or out of the brace. And my own preference is to do them in the brace to allow the brace maker some feedback as to how much in brace correction he can get. Bracing uh, is a challenging program because it has to be carried out in some cases to maturity. What can happen are brace holidays, where if the patient is responding to the bracing, we might be able to give them a holiday during the summer months, for instance. Some of the challenges include the rib deformities that can occur, the deconditioning aspect of being in a, a cast or brace, and the quality of life challenges with having to live much of their day in a brace. The other challenge, of course, is the many x-rays that a patient might accumulate over their lifetime. Other restrictive, less restrictive forms of bracing are now available, including uh, the dynamic movement orthosis. And of course, the physical therapists for some time have been using a form of a, a flexible trunk support called the Bannock brace. There's not a lot published about it at this point, and it may be more suitable for some of the uh, syndromal or neuromuscular uh, patients who seem to respond to the, uh, the intimate fit of, of a, a more dynamic brace rather than a stiff brace. Is tolerance better? That yet is yet to be shown. And the efficacy, once again, is difficult to study. Halo gravity traction has emerged <coughs> once again as another uh, alternative and in some cases We'll do this as an adjunct uh, and either start the whole treatment program with halo gravity traction, or it might be at the end of treatment when we're deciding to put in some Im uh, implants. But halo gravity traction can be done even in very, very young patients. In some extreme cases, the halo can actually even be incorporated into a cast or a brace. Thank you very much for your attention tonight. Thank you so much, Nigel. Um, next, we have uh, Dr. Sukhan Shah, who is an Associate Professor of Orthopedic Surgery and Division Chief at the Alfred I. DuPont Hospital for Children. And Sukhan will be uh, talking about operative treatments for uh, early onset scoliosis. Great, thanks, Mark. Uh, I'm pleased to be here and welcome you all to this webinar. 
Um, my, the previous speakers did an excellent job of telling you about the etiology and diagnosis and non-operative treatment of early onset scoliosis. It's my task to tell you a little bit about the operative intervention. Naturally, we'd like to preserve growth and let these children develop into normal adults, but sometimes surgery is necessary to manage the most progressive challenging curves. Our goals are all the same. We wanna preserve spinal growth, truncal height, develop the lungs, but avoid thoracic insufficiency syndrome, which is a particular problem in some of these children with early onset scoliosis. We heard why fusion before age eight is not a great idea. It eliminates most of that truncal and spinal growth that these kids need. It leads to thoracic insufficiency syndrome, and the crankshaft phenomenon, and sometimes you get recurrence of that deformity later over time. However, there are some exceptions to this early fusion rule. If you have a limited area of congenital scoliosis that can be resected, sometimes an early fusion is the best treatment that preserves normal growth in the rest of the spine. Additionally, we heard about some syndromic scoliosis in which the poor history, which the natural history is very poor. Sometimes these children may benefit from an early fusion, but this is on a case by case basis. This is a graph showing that the more of the thoracic spine that you fuse, the lower the pulmonary function. So this has to be avoided. And this from the same article from Dr. Carroll shows us the longer we can get the spine to grow, the better their pulmonary function. This allowed us for the first time to develop a paradigm for the goal or end of treatment perhaps during the growing years. This is an example of someone who underwent a previous spinal fusion at a very young age. You can see that there's still a lot of deformity there. His trunk is very small. His chest wall is severely limited and rotated. And this is not the outcome that we shoot for at this current time. What are some operative strategies to preserve growth? Well, we can make the spine longer from the back. This is called distraction. And growing rods and vector falls into this category. We can guide growth along a rail, like a trolley, and use a sliding screw construct that doesn't need frequent surgery to allow the spine to grow rather than lock it in place like the fusion can do. We can also slow anterior growth by tethering one side of the spine so the shorter the side of the spine can grow. And sometimes we see correction spontaneously over time. I'll show you examples of all of these throughout this talk. However, the newest data says try and delay surgery for as long as possible. It's because we get better outcomes and results in older children. So rather than four years old, wait till six or seven, and we can continue that growing for another four or so years. This allows us to install better implants, larger soft tissue coverage, avoid infections, allow these children to grow and gain weight more effectively. And we know that if these devices are in for too long, they stop working, they stop lengthening, and we have to revise them. We're trying to make this as few surgeries as possible in that child's growing period. Dr. Campbell um, sort of focused us on the idea that we have to consider the chest wall and pulmonary function when treating the spine as well. He invented this device called the Vector, which can open up some lung fields and allow a child's chest to continue growing. And he also coined the concept of thoracic insufficiency syndrome, which is the inability of the thorax to support that child's breathing capacity. So if a child has an early fusion, they may develop thoracic insufficiency syndrome when they're an adult. And this is something to be avoided. This is a child who would go on to thoracic insufficiency syndrome if the vector devices were not implanted, and you can see an increase in the lung field. This is another child with a hypotonic type of uh, neuromuscular scoliosis, and you can see how nicely his trunk uh, is expanded and he can sit very nicely now that these devices are implanted. And again, this is on a case-by-case -case basis for some of the most challenging deformities. Growing rods seem to be a little bit more versatile. This is what's called spine-based fixation. Um, and uh, originally, Dr. Thompson and Mark Barnia made this technique very popular throughout the world. Two rods are better than one. When these rods are implanted underneath the muscle, we see a lower infection rate. And we are able to achieve almost the kind of growth that you would in the native spine. However, complications are frequent with this treatment variety as well. And in a study that we performed over the Growing Spine Study Group, we found that complications, although less frequent with dual rods, were frequent the longer the rods were in. When you ask surgeons, well, what do you think the best candidate for a growing rod type of patient would be? By convention, we choose patients that are about six years old and 60 degrees. But if you look in the database, the average age at first implantation was younger than that, and the curves were bigger than that. And so sometimes we don't get to choose. 
but the condition chooses for us when casting or bracing fails or these curves are quite progressive and are going to turn into something that's going to be much more challenging if we attempt to tackle that later. The most frequent reasons from, to go from casting or bracing to growing rods was curve rigidity, inability to tolerate the cast or the brace, or a syndromic diagnosis that might make the patient more kyphotic or stooped over. This is about um, the most straightforward patient we might consider for growing rods. They have failed bracing, their curve has progressed to 60 degrees, and they're not very young, but still around six or seven years old. So this is another example, a six-year-old patient with a syndromic diagnosis, sort of like congenital scoliosis. She's progressed despite bracing. She's very stooped over. According to the CEO's classification, we need to act now in order to have the best treatment profile and lowest complication rate. This is her clinical appearance. We installed growing rods after we obtained an MRI scan prior to surgery. This scan showed a tethered cord. We treat that at the same time and do the implantation under monitoring. This is what she looks like at the initial implantation. Clinical photos show an improvement in the deformity. And this is where she is at three and a half years later with six lengthenings and a pretty spectacular growth of that curved part of the spine. And finally, now at four and a half years later, she's done treatment. But this is not without its complications. We know that infection, rod breakage, anchor failure, being stooped over even above the instrumentation, and just the rods getting stuck are all scenarios that we've seen. This is why we are reluctant sometimes to do the implantation at an early age or when we don't think it's quite necessary. And in this article where we outlined the complications of over 140 patients who were lengthened almost 900 times, 58% of those patients had at least one complication. Then the complication risk increased by 24% with each additional surgery. So the longer you have these rods in, the more likely it was to have a complication. And that's just the implants and the surgery related stuff. We know now, thanks to Dr. Vitali's group, that these children may have a sort of post-traumatic stress disorder from repeated surgeries. And we see this in our practice. They don't like to come back to the hospital for repeated lengthenings, and they dread uh, undergoing surgery so many times. And so this has a, has a stress-induced uh, disorder over time, and the younger they are and the more frequent they get surgery, the more severe this is. And furthermore, becoming aware much more to the effects of anesthesia in our most young children when the duration of that anesthesia exceeds more than three hours. So we have to limit, if we can, the number of episodes these children are receiving anesthesia during their young years when their brains are still developing. Early onset kyphoscoliosis is when the patient is very stooped over. You can see the large hump in the back. This is a particularly challenging patient because we know that the rods are more prone to failure when they're loaded in that mode. Strategies to correct um, may be useful if we use traction and we have to pay specific attention to how we contour or bend those rods in surgery to avoid a failure. This is a child you saw before, the severe amount of kyphosis and scoliosis. What can we do? Well, we put them in traction for two weeks. You can see how elegantly straight the spine then becomes. And this is now much more approachable, safer to treat in the operating room. And you can see how we implanted rods here and screws that will slide along that rod so he doesn't need very frequent lengthenings. And we wait for him to grow until the top of the rod is encountered. And this is his clinical appearance after surgery. The new sort of technology available to us now is magnetically driven growth rods. Here, we don't need surgery, but we use an external magnet to tell the internal magnet to rotate and lengthen the rods. The adjustments are formed in clinic when the patient's awake, and the earliest results were done overseas, but this rod is now available in the United States as well. And we know that this technique is reproducible all over the world with very nice results in the early period. There are different configurations, and different lengths of the rods that are appropriate for many of the patients that we treat who are applicable for growing rods. This is a posterior treatment, and you can see with each subsequent stage, the rods get longer in the middle and allow the child to grow and the spine curvature to be well-maintained in a corrected manner. These lengthenings are performed in clinic. This child's playing on his mom's iPhone while we get an ultrasound of the rods, and then we find the rods with a magnet, and we confirm by ultrasound that these rods have gotten longer. So here I am finding that magnet, using the external controller to tell that internal magnet to get longer, 
and then we subsequently use an ultrasound to avoid any further radiation to make sure we actually did get lengthening in the clinic. You can see he's awake. So this is a non-invasive distraction, eliminates repetitive, repetitive surgeries to lengthen. It's a significant reduction in the early complications like infection. And obviously patients don't have to miss school, parents don't have to miss work, and it's a much quicker, cheaper procedure. It eliminates the fear and anxiety associated with multiple surgeries. From the child's standpoint, this is a win-win. But it's not, as we say, magic. Are the complications lower over the long term? We don't know. These rods have only been, able, been available to us for about four years. They are large because of the magnet. They are somewhat difficult to contour, and we have to teach each other the best techniques. There seem to be, as far as implant-related failures, similar complications at two to three years. Sometimes these rods don't lengthen as we expect. Sometimes the, the anchors fail and these rods can break. And that's the nature of treating this very challenging population whose rods require slight motion and dampening so that they can continue uh, to grow and not fuse. Um, what are some of the people who can't have these magnetic rods? Well, if you need frequent MRIs of the spine, it's not great visualization. If you have a pacemaker or a vagal nerve stimulator, you're not a good candidate to have this because of the magnet we need to use on the outside. If you're very small, sometimes the rods are too big. They're extremely expensive and not available in countries with limited resources. And we're not sure if we can leave these in permanently. Earlier, I showed you an example of a patient who was done growing. We left the rods in that were non-magnetic. We don't know whether that's still appropriate with this new technology at this time. And so that brings us to what happens if you're done growing? Do you need a final fusion? We think there's a subset of patients who we can watch and wait and carefully understand that we can leave these rods in and they may go on to fuse themselves because their spine has been held stiff in that manner. But if we do take these patients back to the operating room and change their growing rods to a final fusion, there are some issues. The surgery is able to be done, but the curve correction sometimes is modest. Um, they do lose some blood and we typically have to extend the instrumentation above and below one or two levels to just obtain control. And a recent series showed that this may not be the final surgery. Many of these patients needed another surgery later on in, uh, in that uh, follow-up period to revise something that didn't go quite right or later became a problem. So the road's not over at the final fusion. We have to continue to follow our patients over the long term, learn from them, and get better and better. And finally, this brings us to another new technology called vertebral body tethering. This is not yet FDA approved and tethering patients too early may lead to overcorrection. So extreme caution is necessary in early onset scoliosis because of the tremendous growth potential may lead to overcorrection. Now this is a patient with juvenile onset scoliosis, idiopathic, and he was tethered at age 10 with an excellent outcome at one year post-op. And we're seeing very good early results in the adolescent onset population, but again, extreme caution needs to be uh, exerted in the early onset population for this technique. So in summary, I think early recognition is important as you heard earlier. The diagnosis and workup, including an MRI scan is mandatory. Non-operative treatments have seen a resurgence and are quite successful, especially in delaying treatment until the age for growing rods might be more applicable. We wanna maintain spinal growth and lung function regardless of what treatment we choose for the child and growth modulation methods are most desirable if they could be non-invasive or not require frequent tune-ups. We have learned to manage those complications, but we need to focus on prevention most readily. And final fusion may or not be necessary depending on a case-by-case -case basis. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sergan. At this point, I'd like to uh, go over some of the questions that we obtained from the audience, and I'd like uh, everybody to turn on their webcams. Um, what, our first question is from a parent, and this question, I think, is probably best answered by Mike Vitale. And the question is, um, is there a significance between right and left-sided curves at the time of diagnosis, meaning kind of prognosis, kind of treatment course, uh, et cetera? Thanks, Mark, and uh, thanks for the question from the audience. Uh, Left-sided curves are generally um, thought to be associated with a higher incidence of spinal dysphrasism, spinal cord problems that were mentioned by uh, 
Dr. Price that include things like tethered cord and Arnold Chiari malformation, um, things that sometimes need treatment. Uh, to that extent, the left-sided curve um, requires a little bit more attention, a little bit more management, and may be associated with other problems. To, um, however, I do not think that a left-sided curve is associated with higher rates of progression in the absence of an associated spinal cord dysphrasism. Hope that answered your question. All right, thank you very much, Mike. Um, I have uh, one question for uh, Nigel. <laughs> Nigel, um, so I'll frequently run into surgeons who say, well, I, I don't have a meta casting table, and uh, you know, I don't have any of these fancy traction type things. I use my own version of casting, and it seems to be effective. Uh, is there any information to suggest one type of casting method is superior to another? Um, anecdotally, um, I've kind of compared notes over the last 25 years, which is duration um, over which I've been casting. And um, I, I think that most of us who've gone to a more formal table, I just find the whole process a little easier. Certainly you can do them on uh, converted spica tables, which people will use for uh, hip casting. Um, you can um, um, miniaturize uh, some of the, um, or at least adapt some of the old wrister tables, which were sort of large frames for adults. But I, what I found is that there's a, a lot of efficiency and, and some degree of increased um, effectiveness and safety when you use a table that's really downsized appropriately for a, a small child. Every, all of us can get around it. So um, yes, you can do it. There's no question you can still put an effective cast on, but I think that if you have all the components um, uh, of, a, of an AML table, which is what ours, or, the, or there's a new one in, that's manufactured in the States, um, I, I think it just brings a little bit more efficiency to the whole process, frankly. All right, thank you very much. Um, this next question is uh, for Bill. Bill, is it, uh, is it ever okay to not obtain an MRI uh, upon first diagnosis of early onset scoliosis or scoliosis in the young child? Um, that's a great question. I, I think several of my colleagues have alluded to the uh, concerns about anesthesia. Uh, if you have a, uh, a one-year-old with maybe a small curve who appears to be otherwise normal, whose rib vertebral angle difference is, is, is small, as Nigel talked about, sometimes observation is appropriate. Uh, I usually discuss it with the family and, and say that uh, certainly before any major intervention, I would uh, recommend an MRI. Uh, in some places, it's even possible to do it under the same anesthetic as you do the casting, uh, although that's kind of a logistical uh, um, trick to do. So I, I think that it does, I think it has, you have to have a low threshold for doing it, but I don't think it's absolutely required on the initial visit in every child. All right, thank you very much, Bill. I think uh, we have one question for Sukin. And Sukin, you kind of offered a very interesting last slide on vertebral body tethering. And we understand that it is uh, quite experimental at this point with uh, kind of by a positive early data. Um, who would you say is a reasonable candidate for vertebral body tethering? Because this is a question that does come up from parents uh, in office. Well, that's uh, subject to a lot of different opinions. And the, I think the reason we're calling it experimental is we need to do more experiments on it as well. I think we need to assemble some really good knowledge and hopefully we'll be able to study this effectively and give people some solid recommendations. But I think the easiest way to answer your question is someone who is, is definitely destined to progress. Uh, the other treatments such as bracing may not be well tolerated. And it's someone who we think that preserving motion is going to be more valuable than uh, achieving traditional surgery. So in my mind, it would be a 10-year-old who has not yet gone through peak height velocity or is in the middle of peak height velocity with a significant curve, 40 to 60 degrees. We know that that's going to get worse. We know we need some growth remaining to, and harness that growth with tethering. And perhaps they can gain the benefit of getting some correction over time while still preserving motion. Thank you, Susan. Uh, Sugan.
I think uh, one last question for Nigel. Uh, we have one parent who says, is there a cutoff age for casting? How old is too old for casting? <clears throat> uh, that really um, addresses some of the art and science uh, of all this treatment. Um, and I would say that uh, conventionally, most people probably give up casting by sort of school age because of the social challenges. But I, I would uh, I would say that um, uh, casting uh, older kids uh, really is a, a very individual uh, decision between patient, family, and, and practitioner. Certainly in parts of uh, Europe, uh, casting goes on you know, well into later childhood and uh, with, with some good um, effects, I mean, in terms of delaying surgery and, and things like that. So I, I certainly, I think probably anybody who's been casting for a while has pushed that envelope a little bit. I've, I've got some patients who have casted in mid-childhood um, and it uh, has helped to delay. So I don't think there's a fixed number. I think that uh, by the time school age rolls around, though, I think that um, most people have either tried to brace or we've gotten them into sort of a, a more practical age for um, some kind of growing um, technology, some kind of surgery. So if we've been able to delay into mid-childhood, I think we've, we've accomplished part of our mission. Thank you so much, Nigel. Um, at this point, uh, I just want to say we're probably a little bit out of time for the webinar. I want to thank our excellent speakers for providing a very informative session on scoliosis and the young child. Um, all additional questions that we haven't been able to get to will be answered via email and through the SRS. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, and have a good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.